Okay, let's go ahead and get ourselves started with session 16 of 120C, 220C. Okay, today we are going to go ahead and focus most of our energy on search schemes and different way algorithms for controlling search. So we're finally going to get to the whole well loop versus the genetic algorithm way of looking at things using a tool called Optimal. So we'll go ahead and take a look at a couple different variations at that. Um, in terms of where we were last time, you might remember last time we were spending uh, some time just building a uh, design type or something that would go ahead and start pulling real Reddit data from rooms, uh, match it up with some cell data values, and then based on that, do some calculations. And we sort of left off, oh, we had gone through and figured out some room information and where doors were going to be required or where there weren't enough doors being uh, uh, allowed in different rooms. We sort of left right off in the whole uh, notion of windows and kind of doing that. Well, I'm going to just uh, finish that example up because there's a few, you know, one or two more nodes to add to it to make that happen. As the first thing we'll do today, then we're going to go ahead and switch our attention to just thinking about uh, this whole notion of a well loop, how we could actually go through and test parameter values by always considering whether or not something is true and stopping. We'll talk about the efficiency of doing that versus uh, going through and using a genetic algorithm, which is even more efficient in some ways in being able to kind of search a very large space of potential alternatives and try to come up with uh, just like what we think the optimal solution is. Just as you think ahead to these last few weeks of the quarter and you're wondering about kind of how we are going to finish up, the final step here is really going to be, again, to go through and design something. We're going to go through and really try to come up with some problem where we can start to apply this optimization and evaluation stuff by flexing some parameters and then testing to sort of see what sort of values are yielded. Okay, and then ultimately try and come up with a sort of a rationale and a recommendation for what you think the optimum is. And as you think about this and you start thinking about a problem that you might choose to attack with all this like a technology infrastructure, think about something where there are maybe two different variables you could be changing and maybe two different ways you could be evaluating it. Okay, so think about something that has a couple of different input parameters and also a couple of different evaluation metrics that we can sort of use as trade-offs against each other. Because going ahead and kind of just uh, varying two different things, whether it's the height and the twist, or whether it's the orientation of the building and the height, or there's all these different things we can vary about different forms to try and test. Um, as we go through and vary those, we could go through and do it sort of single variable wise or like we did last time uh, with uh, pairs, we could start to combine them together in different combinations and exhaustively think about an entire space. What we're going to find is that genetic algorithms are actually very good at combining two, three, or even four variables together and choosing a lot of different points to sample and try to evaluate things. But it comes down at the other end to evaluation. You have to figure out how you're going to be considering the strength of this potential solution. And whether that's based on some sort of metric about the surface area, or some sort of metric about how big a shadow it casts on the landscape, or some sort of metric about uh, like how much solar insulation is hitting the surfaces that we might be able to use as a uh, kind of solar collector surface. Yeah. There's all these different things we might consider. So what I'm going to have you do just today is kind of plant the seed of a problem, a problem that you're going to go ahead and define that you'd like to go ahead and tackle, kind of using this sort of optimization infrastructure. But then we'll talk about them individually. So think about a problem that you think would be interesting to solve, you know, whether that's sort of energy-based, whether it's form-based, whether it's strength-based. Think about something that you'd be interested in solving, then we can talk about how to scope it down and actually make it fit the box of what we have available. Okay. But in general, think about something where there's a couple of different ways of looking at it. So we can have a trade-off between two different evaluations and you can try to figure out really where the, it's really not going to be a single optimal solution. There's going to be a curve of opti a potentially optimal solutions or equally attractive solutions. Okay. We'll get to that. Okay, but let us go ahead and just dive into today. What I wanted to do at the starting point was just kind of finish up that whole notion of evaluating Revit rooms, 
for that little design advisor. Um, if you go ahead and open up 16.1, you'll see there's still a little bit of tail end infrastructure on the example that we were working on last time. So if you go to 16.1, what we had done the last time was we had downloaded and installed both Clockwork and Lunchbox, our custom utility packages, or nodes. Uh, we had gone through and basically uh, got some model values, some Excel files. We sort of put those together and color coded the rooms. We computed a design occupancy for each room. It's based on the area and the occupancy, so how many people would fit in the room. And based on that, we figured out if there were enough doors. So that was actually pretty much OK. Uh, we next said, hey, what if we could go ahead and just extend this example to just really considering the window area? And we can use this to consider the window area. We can use it to consider the ventilation area, any number of things we might pull from the model just to see if the model is adequate. If we were going to use the window area, we were going to use the kind of threshold of 10% you know, of the floor area needing to be provided through windows. And again, what that is considered is a, kind of a lighting threshold. If you don't have that, you have to put in artificial lights, which you probably would do anyway, but they sort of would prefer that you actually provide a little bit of natural lighting and do it that way. Um, what else? Um, that's independent of the lead daylighting criteria, which actually would probably have even more window than that. But I mean, it wouldn't be based on floor area, it would be based more on a realistic evaluation of just how much light, how many lumens were actually in the room at different times. In fact, if anyone wants to sort of do an evaluation like that, there's a really cool example that I can point you to where it has a building, we have windows all over the side of the building, and it basically tries to optimize the size of the windows to get just the right amount of daylighting in the building. Because if you've ever played with that, you know, it's a little bit tricky in whether you have too much or too little, and it'd be nice to sort of have something that could focus in and kind of uh, adjust the window parameters to sort of uh, get you to the size that's required to provide that right amount of daylight. Okay, but what we're going to do is continue with the whole notion of the windows and do that by just opening up 16.1. 16.1, oh, let me go ahead and pop on out over here. Let me exit the full screen. So we get a little bit of camera action. Hmm. Oh well. <laughs> Let me go open up Revit again. Actually, I think Revit may already be open. And open up. I'll close that one up for right now, just to conserve some resources. I'll open up 16.1 again. So in 16.1, you might remember we have a little building. This building's going to look a little bit different now. I added some windows to it just so we had a little bit more to work with. So we have a building, it's got some basic uh, spaces, some spaces that are allocated by the room, or um, sort of indicated functionality by the room designations of the occupancy. Uh, we have a bunch of doors and windows in there, and we were just going through and evaluating this space. And to get yourself started, go ahead and open up really uh, 6A. What we're going to be doing is, for all those different rooms, uh, calculate sort of the floor area. That we can actually pull up right out of the model. Say 10% of the floor area, to sort of figure out what the required um, window area would be. And then for each of the different rooms, go through and just sum up uh, the total window area. And that's where we left it last time. So if you go on over to I do my add-ins. Go to Dynamo. And if you open up 16.1, let's go to 6A. So 
So this graph has a lot of stuff in it that we have already worked with last time, so we won't go back over all that stuff. There's a lot of information in here. Oh, just roughly in terms of giving the rooms, kind of uh, computing or bringing these different volumes that represent the rooms, uh, gathering some values, looking at some Excel things, and just going through and doing some matching. And all through this part of the graph, right in here, we were going through and just doing all the door calculations. So we're going to go up just a little bit higher and focus on windows instead. So if you come on in here at a high level, way over on the left-hand side, what we're doing is grabbing all the rooms. And then from the rooms, we were gathering a little information. So. One thing we did was we wanted to go through and compute the room area. So for the room area, what we did was we just said that, or the uh, required window area, we were just going to take the room area and multiply it by 10%. For the room area, we actually got that as one of our parameters. So way back over in the get parameter values, We snag the area. So that should theoretically have a nice set of values in it now. If I go through and even run right now, I'm just going to give it a quick one. Yeah, Tom. Um, those custom lists match values. What was that from again? Um, it was oh, from it? Clockwork, or the other one was Lunchbox. I think it came from Clockwork. Okay. But if you're on a machine where you don't have that yet, go ahead and reload it. The other one that that kind of brings is a lot of uh, these room dot or uh, room dot windows or room dot doors, things like that. So at some level, we go through and look at all these different rooms, compute 10%, and I can start to see there's a certain amount of window area required for each of the rooms. Okay, so anywhere from 88 all the way down to like 20, something like that. But that's our target. We're going to be comparing from that. What we're going to do is say, hey, let us go ahead and compute the window area in each of these rooms. And what we are going to go through and do is kind of put together two things to make that happen. We're going to use room.windows, which I guess was that a function that I think came out of uh, clockwork. It's giving us basically a list of windows by rooms. You'll see that some rooms have a lot of windows, other rooms have no windows. So room zero has five or six windows. Room one has uh, three windows. Room two has no windows in it right now. Okay, so we've got a whole bunch of windows. What I'd love to do is take that list right over here and pull out really just the height and width, multiply it together, and get an area for all those windows. And how we had to do this was as follows. We wanted to go ahead and really figure out how much window area there was in each room. This higher level list is broken into rooms, so that was a good grouping. In order to compute room by room, we needed to use a list map, because we're going to feed each of these high level lists in and evaluate it individually. So that's where list map comes from. Okay. We're going to feed in those, and room by room, it's going to evaluate it. And then we constructed a little evaluation function for doing the window area in each room, and that was a little custom note that we put together. So at a high level, you can sort of imagine what we're going to do is in each of these groups, we're going to take each window one at a time and look up its height, look up its width, and multiply them together. So since, again, I'm going to do one item at a time, you might imagine there's a list map within this node. Okay, so you have a list map with a list map. List of the rooms followed by the list of the windows. But if I edit this custom node, you'll sort of see, if you give me a list of windows in the room, what I'm going to do is do a list map where I get the area of each individual window. And then I'm going to sum them up for the entire room. So at a high level, this function is not too often bad. Just give me a list of all the windows. I'm going to go through and take every window one at a time and get its area and sum them up and get the total area. So that part's not too bad. However, we needed to get the area of each window, which was not a parameter that comes automatically. 
kind of disappointing. You sort of think it would be, but it's not. Okay, so what I had to do is go back in and add, create a custom node that was going to, for every window, go through and get the height and get the width, and then multiply them together. Now, a very important point we got to last time, where we, we sort of finished up last time and it was having some troubles and failing, was on this whole notion that when we tried to get the parameter by name, we were getting nulls in there. And sort of, you know, we stumble, we sort of say, hmm, why is that? They seem to have that. The difference is, as we are going through and getting parameter values by name, if it's an element, we can just pass the element to it. Okay? But if the parameter we want is a type parameter, not an instance parameter, okay, then we have to actually go back and get the type of the element okay, and pull it that way. So there's the individual window. This individual window is like a fixed 36 by 84. So what I have to do is not just get the individual window, I have to get the type so that I can pull a type parameter as opposed to the instance parameter. And sorry if that's confusing. That's just kind of this funkiness about where we have the parameters living, you know, at the high level or the low level. But element that type was a fantastic function. Again, I think it came from, did it come from Lunchbox or Clockwork? It was one of those. Clockwork? Clockwork's a fantastic group of things. It finds all sorts of good stuff for you. But the net net of all of this is that we're going to go through, grab the height and width, we're going to multiply them together and return that. So, I actually just, for completeness, also return the window height and the window width, just in case you might need them. Go back into window area by room. So my list map, I have the choice here of which of those values I'm going to pull, whether it's the area, the height, the width. I can only pull one, though. If I want to pull several, I have to put them together in a list and pull the list. Okay? So I'm going to pull the window areas. That should give me a list of all the areas for all the windows in each room, sum them up, and I get the total area. Okay. So let's just pause there for a second, because that's kind of the gist of it right there. Let's just sort of see if all that list mapping makes sense to people in terms of these two different custom nodes. Sometimes I get nodes inside of nodes inside of nodes inside of nodes. It's really, it's, which gets very hard to debug, as many people will attest to, because it's kind of hard to do the watching inside of nodes that are uh, list mapped. But the net of all this should be, I have a list of areas. Let's go ahead and see what the list of uh, areas provided is. Okay, so let's check it out. We should be in the same sort of order. So how are we gonna figure out which of these are adequate and which of these are inadequate? Like, can you spot which ones are, you know, is the first one adequate or inadequate? It looks like it's inadequate right now. It's got, it has 72, it wants 88, so it's on the bad side. Next one has 36, requires 26. Okay, that looks, that's looking good. So it looks like I'm just going to go through and compare these things. And based on the comparison, I can say, hey, let's get the areas provided and the areas uh, required. And if provided is greater than required, and that is true, then you'd be considered adequate. If it's not false, then you'd be inadequate. That sounds like a oh, um, uh, list filter by Boolean sort of thing. So uh, to set that up, we go next door here. I'm going to do the provided window area and the required window area. Okay, and that's going to give me, hopefully, a whole bunch of true false values. Let's let that run. Actually, I got two different things there. Let me tell you what I got going. Okay. If I just do the greater than or less than, so provided, let's see which way I wrote this, because I could rewrite it the other way here. I'm looking for true being provided is less than uh, what's required.
that would give me trues on the inadequates as opposed to trues on the uh, adequates. Now, just having this list of trues or falses is already sufficient to go through and say, hey, given that trues and falses, we can go through and list, filter by Boolean mask, filter that in, provide it with the list of windows in each of the rooms, and it'll only include the ones that are inadequate. It won't include the ones that are adequate. So if I was just going to go through and colorize them, give them a red color or something to show you that things are inadequate in these rooms, that would be sufficient. So you can go through and do that. That's what this list filter does right here. List, filter by Boolean mask, it takes those. So you'll see if you come on in here, there's going to be a list of, this should be windows in the rooms where they're inadequate. Actually, in this case, what I'm doing is just highlighting the rooms where it's inadequate. So what I did was, it's all in the same order. These are the rooms that have inadequate windows. What I'm doing actually here for my list, I could have grabbed a list of windows. It all depends how I want to graphically portray this for you. What I went through is, and I did, I grabbed those masses, those masses that I could colorize and pull them across. Okay, so those masses that I created, oh, way back where? Right over here, that we were colorizing. pull them across, and we are ready to go. Now, with that list of masses, we have the ins and we have the outs again. So in terms of the ins, if I want to get all the inadequate ones and I want to colorize them just to sort of indicate, hey, this is a room that has a problem, what I can do is let's take that list and I'm just going to override it with some color. So for example here, I can take that big old list um, only the ends, I'm going to override the color of those masses with a nice red color. Okay. And that actually seems pretty reasonable. So let's go ahead and do that as a starting point. That should highlight in the model now all the rooms with inadequate windows. Let me go to show the masses and the walls. Let's see what's going on here. I got those. I got the colors. Let me try running this, see if it all works. Okay. So what that's telling me is all of those rooms have inadequate windows right now. Okay. You have a different one, or what do you have? I do not have an one. Not at all. Well, let's just kind of track it through and figure it out. Uh, do you have a nice uh, list filter by Boolean mask? Do you have a bunch yes. of tr in there? Yeah. And on the uh, inside right now, do you have a bunch of values in there? Yeah. Okay. Is that connected to the element color over I view? Okay. So, it looks like you can kind of click on that one down to see if there's a bunch of elements that have been overridden in yeah. color. They are. Okay. Then let's go back to the just the Revit file. It could be that the view is just not showing those. Try changing over from show walls only. Okay. Try changing to show masses and walls. Yeah, it's in either of the views, show masses only, show masses and walls. Either of them is not showing. Interesting. Okay. Is anyone else getting it to show? Let's start with that. Okay, you're getting it to show. Mine twice, though. You had to run it twice? Yeah. Okay. Andrew, did you get it to work? Lama, how about you? My um, elements are Let's Let us just sort of see if I can figure out a pattern here. Okay. So, I got some nice import instances. That looks fine. That looks fine over there. It should be overriding in that. Okay, let's go back over to... They're the same values. What does that mean? Yeah. Oh, no, no. Actually, it's the same instance. It's just the color will be different. So let's just take a look and you got it now? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I just got it. I ran it twice. It's like I hit the button. It's beautiful. Okay, so so far it looks like uh, many of the rooms aren't quite adequate yet. Okay. Let's 
Let me go ahead and let's adjust this just a little. Here's the deal. If I go through and I add some more windows to some of these rooms, I'd like that color graph to change so the reds become whites and stuff like that. We have to do a little change though to make that happen because here's the problem with color overriding. Color overriding, once you override something, if you run it again, it's no longer overridden, it won't undo it. Okay? So what I need to do is actually be a little more explicit about this. I could say if you're in or you're failing, give you red. If you're okay, give you green. And that way, if things change, it'll always explicitly set your color. Okay, so let's change the graph around just a little bit like that so we can see what that effect is. And then we'll go through and start adding some windows. So here's the deal. I have all my ins, they're all being overridden in red. If I take all my outs and I override them in green, okay, then I'll have something that should toggle. So let's take all my outs. Those are going to be the ones where it is adequate. Let's try running that. Yeah, we're looking back here. Okay, that's not too awfully bad. Let's see if you can get like uh, that one little room to show up in green. Doing good? Nothing is, Nothing is happening, Dom. Why is that? <laughs> Let us see. Maybe we need to change the view. Let's see what's going on here. Do you have, let's kind of take a gander at what's going on there. Okay, those look good. And you have these kind of scan down here and we'll gander down there. Okay, yeah, that's looking good. Come back over to Revit. So your dynamo looks like it's doing the right thing. Let's switch the view to, uh, there's another view that's called like to show uh, masses or something. Try that one. Show masses and walls. Now try running it. Now try running it. Oh, I'll tell you why it's even going on there. It's interesting. It only overrides the things in the current view, so if you weren't in that view, you have to rerun it after you switch to that view. Yeah. I think masses were not displayed in my masses. Yeah. Like in this article, and it's going to be a little bit of a piece of it. Okay. Very good. Um, that's a piece of it, too. For a reason. Yeah. yeah. Okay. How are you doing? Can you see them? Yeah. Or I'm Great. Or you just see them. That's one. Okay. Just go ahead and map those back into the green. Now, if you would like to experiment with this and see how it works, how about this? Let's go ahead and try putting some more windows into a room. So for example, oh, I got a small room over here on the other side. It won't require very many windows. It only has one window right now. I could either add another window to it or even just make it bigger. Let's just try over here. I'll put another window in this little room. Now, before you go through and rerun the script, watch out for this. This is something that you know, I kept on getting in trouble with. It's this whole notion that um, you have to, as long as it still says modify place window over here, um, the node's not picking up the new update, so click it over to modify after you've added some windows. Let's go ahead and give that a run. Okay, so one's better, the other one's not quite there. If I can keep on sort of tweaking with it. But let me go ahead and kind of think about how to make this a little bit better. And this gets to sort of thinking about user feedback and systems and how you might provide it. The idea right now is in this sort of design advisor, it's kind of hit or miss. Either you're in or you're out. Everything's good, everything's bad. And the truth is, that's okay to sort of know whether you've sort of uh, met the requirements. But it's not as helpful as it might be in terms of helping you understand how close are you. Because if you're actually pretty close to being OK and you just need to adjust a few things, that's different than, oh, you're way off the mark and need to really make a radical change. So 
what I want to do is actually use, it's a good just general principle to apply to a lot of problems, is go through and not only go through and apply the whole notion of are you greater than or less than, but actually to go through and compute a little ratio. Okay? And the nice thing about the ratio of provided window area versus required window area, it's kind of like an efficiency ratio in structures where we can say that, okay, you know, if we are over one, that means we are better than we need to be. If we are under one, that means we're worse than we need to be. And depending upon how close you are to one, okay, you have a pretty good sense of are you near the cusp or not. For example, room of six over here is at 0.946. Oh, I am so close. You know, there's some little tweak I need to make there. We're Room 4 at 0.268, that's very bad off right now. I really need to do something very radically different there. Okay. So the idea of providing these, giving these ratios gets to be sort of interesting. Okay. So here's the scheme that I came up with that I thought might provide some useful feedback. If I took all of those guys, bop, 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 these different numbers right down here, and I went through and did a little remapping to the whole thing. I could go ahead and somehow like map your ratio to um, like a color value so that it'd be somewhere between like solid red and very, very pale red, that we get sort of a range of values in there. That is, if you're really bad off, make it solid red, if you're pretty close, make it paler and paler red until you finally get to green. Something like that. That's just kind of a good general purpose scheme. So in thinking about that, it's actually not too bad. What I want to do is go through and for all these different values over here, just do a little calculation. See, what I would like to do is actually take all these guys over here and just do a little bit of rescaling. Let me go ahead and load, to get this right, let's go ahead and open up uh, 6B. Sorry, don't mislead you here. So here's what I want to do. What I want to do is we're going to go ahead and take those ratios, okay, let that be our list. I'm going to use the same mask though, the same true or falses. Because what I'm going to do is just basically say, let me run this again, so you can get all those values exposed. going to say is that basically if you're in the true bucket, okay, you are basically just going to go through and be highlighted as green. If you, however, are on the, uh, the in bucket, if you're in the, or excuse me, if you're in the false bucket, in the out bucket, and you're considered out of it right now, you're going to go straight to green. If you're on the in bucket, though, however, what we're going to do is we're going to go through and compute sort of a range okay, of uh, like different values, scaling from 0 to 255, and sort of adjust the color based on that. So let's show you what that looks like. At a high level, what we're going to do is just break the list into two. Either you're below one or you're above one. Okay, and we did that just by doing the filter on the, all the ratios, okay, using the same sort of uh, requirements, okay, whether it's greater or less than. So that's super. What I want to do now is for all these numbers between 0 and 1, but not quite 1, is go through and rescale them. Because in our color scheme, anything between, uh, you know, we go from uh, 0 to 255, okay. Um, so we want to scale basically 0 to 1 to be 0 to 255. So I'm going to just do a little <laughs> remap on that. So the way you might interpret that is the 
the closer you are, the more intense the number is here. The less you are, the less intense the number is here. And then how that actually works is when it comes time to pull them over, okay, I won't just give them reds. What I'm going to do is actually give them a little bit of green and blue. What happens to solid red if you start introducing green and blue, it gets whiter and whiter. Okay, so 255 red, green, blue is white. So if you say 255 red and 100 red, or 100 green and 100 blue, it's kind of a pink color. It's somewhere between. So what we're doing is taking the red and just also introducing the green and blue colors at some intensity. And what that does is just scales the images so that based on how close you are, okay, and sort of the closer you are, the wider you are, Okay, so it's going to go everywhere from solid red being incredibly bad to almost to white being so close to the edge but not quite there, and green means you crossed over and you're in the good zone now. So let's go ahead and run that and see how that goes. What I'm going to do here is even I'm going to take all these out again just because. Since I generated all those masses before, it may not be referring to the right ones. Actually, it might be okay now. What's that? I did not delete. What I wanted to do is show masses. Since, since I opened, well, it probably would still work. It does work. Did work? Okay. Let's just go back over then. Let's try running this. I'm not getting my color overriding the way I want to, though. There's still two reds, so let me sort of figure out why that is. Actually, you can. Anyway, I have the same function. Where I have to be greater than being on yeah, that's what I was thinking. I think that might be better. I think it's because uh, they're already overridden or something like that. Let's go and take a look. Okay. So you go, oh, that's looking a little bit better. It looks like it regenerated itself. Okay. So this graph I would interpret as. These rooms which are white but not quite let get green, they are very, very close but not quite there. The reds are way off, the greens are actually good right now. So if you know that the white room is actually pretty close and you just need to adjust it a little, you could try adding more windows or just try uh, like changing to a larger window size. For example, let me go as opposed to 36 by 48, let's go back 36 by 72 or something like that. And I'll do a little 36 by 72 action over here too. Did you change anything like other than putting the window area? I'm trying to let's go back and take a look. I think there was a couple more thing steps in there. So what am I doing? I'm taking the little ratios. And watch out for this. What you have to do is for the list, go ahead and get the list of the ratios. And the mass is the greater than or less than. Let's just check it one step at a time. Are you getting? Oh. They look like they're, they're parallel. But they yeah, they're actually, parallel, they're actually they're crossing. crossing. Okay, that's the problem. No worries. So see if you can get the ones that are less than one to sort into the in group, and then we're going to take those and scale those between 0 and 255, and then just apply those as green blue values to sort of white out the red. How's that working for you, Lama? Is that kind of working? Yeah, I was having that problem too. Oh, no worries. Oh, no. <laughs> 
it, that's almost why I went over to 6B just to see it, because it's like uh, okay. my little crossed eyes are going to like uh, get that wrong. So great, we got some of this. Let me try writing this. I think that the uh, room towards the front with the bigger windows should probably be okay now, but let's take a look. Ah, so it shifted over to the green zone. So we're slowly but surely knocking them down. So the idea of this is really there's a couple of big things to do. A, you can go ahead and get values out of the Revit model and kind of compare them to design code requirements, which is good. You can sort of like, it's nice to have something that you can just sort of say, let me run a code check on you before I submit it to uh, someone who'll do it manually so you can kind of pre-flight it and make sure that you're meeting all the requirements. Okay. B, um, as you're going through, if you go through and do any sort of overrides, Watch out for the whole case of if things flip between being good or bad. If you only override one side of the equation, you know, it may not reflect the change, so it's always better to sort of have a positive and a negative so that you're explicitly controlling the color. That way, things that ended up being red but later shifted don't remain red and just kind of confuse you. And the third piece I'd sort of call out about this is just the whole notion of scaling, if you're going to provide some sort of color feedback or something like that, you know, it's not only just whether it's true or false, you might be able to kind of uh, give a little extra feedback to help people understand what needs to happen. For example, oh, this room over here, it looks like it's pretty close. This lunchroom area, that looks like we're pretty far off in there, so you might have to add a lot of windows there. For some of these different spaces, or oh, maybe this big hallway area, even though that they're restrooms or something like that, they may be exempt from this requirement. Okay, so it would also be nice to have some sort of flag we're checking for to see, did you just, you know, do you even require this? And like in daylight, you do that because only regularly occupied rooms get considered. Ones that aren't regularly occupied would just knock off the consideration. So we could pull them off, we could even color them yellow or something like that just to indicate they're not being considered. So that's our little design advisor, just kind of pulling values and kind of bringing them across. Um, kind of a good thing to look at in terms of, as you know, you're thinking about um, your models, what you might do for the uh, final project. You can go ahead and do things that are very mathematically driven, but if you have some Revit models, we could also just actually pull values out of the Revit models and uh, kind of work with them too. So kind of go either way. I kind of like just working with and manipulating Revit stuff just because it feels like it's, oh, giving you a handy little boost or something like that or something. And now after I finish my designs, having to check these requirements, you know, I might slip. So it's always good to go through and I probably have about five things I should check always just to make sure they were met just because they're sort of very easy code requirements. Okay, super. Let us put that one away. How about this? It's 11.20 now. I'm going to flip it a little. Why don't we go ahead and just take our break now for five minutes. And when you come on back, we're going to shift our gears very rapidly and just start talking about looping strategies and how to do searches. Okay. So it's going to sort of uh, look sort of similar to this in some ways. Okay. So come on back in five.